Now it's started. Um, okay, so welcome to the Merge Implementers goal number one. Um, this goal is supposed to be the technical discussion around the merge. Um, yeah, thanks for the agenda, Danny. Um, yeah, and uh, all the most of the governance discussion is uh, dedicated to the all core devs call. So this is just uh, to focus on technical stuff. Um, today we have uh, like um, a huge chunk of uh, discussion around the application layer. Um, I think that if we uh, will not cover some items from the consensus layer part, it will be okay because uh, it's been discussed like for a long period of time uh, on different uh, conversations. But yep, the main focus for today, the application layer. So let's go uh, through um, all, all these um, items and to the discussion. Um, but before we start, uh, I'd like to um, turn turn uh, to Proto uh, to make an announcement about the Rainism. So Proto, welcome. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, so this Tuesday, we announced Rayonism. And this is a project around the EVE Global Skating Hackathon. That's around two weeks from now. And we have these two targets. The first target is to run a testnet with Ethereum 2 nodes that utilize the Ethereum 1 nodes for the application layer, just like in the latest merge uh, specifications, but without the transition overhead. And then the second target is to throw, to take this prototype further and develop additions like uh, shared data. And so the goal is not to churn through like a lot of new code. It's just not necessary for the prototype. The goal or like the real failure proposition here for everyone is this opportunity where everyone can get involved, where we can get ready for the development of this milestone. And then on the Ethereum one side, this means the implementation of this new API. We have these four new routes that have been discussed at length and will continue to iterate on. And then on the Ethereum two side, this means that we can take the existing phase zero implementations, modify them and uh, put them to use in an early testnet. And then after we get running, we can take our time for a production prototype where we can think about the fork transition, implement these different block types and do the whole, like the whole implementation work for the actual fork. And so that's all that, that these are the essentials for uh, a multi-client merge testnet. And um, of course there's more we could do and we are happy to support this, but like we're not going to delay an early testnet for it. And so if you can get this running quickly, then during the hackathon, we'll have this opportunity to have some developers on our testnet with, the, with use, using the EVM on proof of stack. And then we have a working network to test later production code against. I hope we can stabilize on some specification that we can have the later more complete clients to test against. And then uh, we'll stabilize the essentials like the RPC and unblock sharding prototyping. So the idea is that some of us like to take this further and implement these experimental things like sharding and then having this very minimal base uh, ready uh, would unblock a lot of work there. And then next week, we're trying to plan in an early birth call where we go over some of the organizational stuff. Uh, we don't get started just yet, but we are trying to prepare in the coming two weeks. And then after the call, I'll try to set, pick a date and organize that. And then this call, we just focus on the general merge. Great. Yep. Thanks, Brodo. So this is going to be a very exciting event. And um, I guess we will like work during the next couple of weeks on the stack for, um, for the 
uh, for the merchant for Shardin for uh, the Ryanair's project so it's mentioned by Frodo so stay tuned um, yep. okay so uh, let us any questions uh, regarding the Ryanism, the hackathon um, so just confirming the goal is to make a prototype of, of a post-merge uh, combined application at consensus layer and not do the transition. Is that what I understood? The initial goal, yes. The initial. And we're okay. already kind of there with mm -hmm. some of the clients. Mm -hmm. but the specification is moving faster. I would so like mm -hmm. to align on this and get right. everyone involved. And mm -hmm. then after this first step, mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. focus on the transition and like the more, these more complicated topics. Okay, makes sense. Right, and the, the meta, the primary meta goal is to like have teams just have someone or multiple people kind of dig in, understand specs, understand complexity of this project and how things kind of fit together and also kind of feed back into the process of specifications uh, so that we can, you know, come in May, end of May, like have a really um, ironed out spec and roadmap from here. I have a question uh, to Prota. Uh, I'm working on withdrawals. Uh, I have uh, uh, um, modified Catalyst, modified Solidity, modified Tecu. So uh, I could not deploy this fin to any any testnet. It could work only only uh, itself. Uh, so could I participate in Ryanism uh, with this uh, piece of uh, software and some proposed specs? Yes, um, tentative yes. So I know your prototype requires an additional opcode to introduce beacon block routes. Yeah, yeah, that, that, route. they, they, are no, uh, they are not in spec uh, and uh, there are other modification in the RPC, right. etc. So I think we can get a um, testnet running early, but then it's up for discussion which exact opcodes go into this te testnet. And so if you do include this opcode, then we can prototype this withdrawal process as well. Right. And even if it doesn't go into like some sort of shared test net or spec for the time being, you know, we can run some transient test nets in isolation and, and kind of test things, uh, which would still be valuable. Okay, cool. So I will participate in it with withdrawal. Great. Okay. So I guess we can move on. Great. Um, so um, yeah, the application layer discussion. There is a doc. Uh, this is the high level design document rather than the spec. It's, uh, it tries to uh, give a holistic view on the um, consensus upgrade from the application node or from the main net node perspective. So, um, yeah, and I would like just to go through the main sections of this document and stop for discussion. Uh, so, and I think it makes sense to share the screen or how do you? think it's better to do. Yeah, that works. Yeah, cool. Uh, before I start, any specific questions to, to the document? Or not to, to the whole document, do you have anything? Okay. Um, is there an intention to make a uh, parallel document for consensus layer perspective? Um, I would say that the um, the way that the ETH2 specs are written are kind of, they're be very beacon chain centric and our mm -hmm. implementers are very familiar with understanding mm -hmm. that. Um, and so we could add additional notes, I think, to flesh that out, but I, I don't think there's like an immense value for that. And, and like I think that. like the, the challenge that I think is that like, we don't want to have a like imbalance between levels of specificity like uh, as is there even uh, like 
like what, what what would you say is the doc the for like the the corresponding thing right now for the consensus way of perspective that covers like say the transition condition and uh, beacon block changes and, and those things like is there, you're right, uh, you're right in that yeah right now there's only really the the consensus perspective which really doesn't get into like the design document where it's saying like you actually use these methods to communicate to the application layer so mm. i think there's a parallel but i think it's probably uh a quarter of the length so we could probably write it up and has more to do with like these mm -hmm. these methods okay makes sense yeah i also think that the transition process should be described like for both uh, parties uh, like in details so what one party is doing then what the expectation like from the application layer and what consensus layer is doing at this moment so that would make a lot of sense to give the end uh, the understanding of the whole process so, oh, yeah but rather than the spec in the beacon in these two specs repo i think we like don't have uh anything more recent with regard to that yeah okay so yeah i think we can start with like new block format uh yeah there is like the interaction between the consensus and application layers it has like four messages um but i would start from the we can get back to this like interaction um i would just start from the new block format because it looks like a simple thing so yeah there could be debates about extra data and so forth but what what's proposed is to just set um a bunch of fields uh, that are uh, related to the proof of work consensus to the if hash um just set to some constants and uh, keep them uh, on entirely on the application layer in the application block and uh, what will what is going to be exposed to the consensus to the beacon block body is the like the actual block uh, the actual mainnet block uh with uh, with all these fields just thrown away um, so and uh, what will be on top of that is, is the block hash is the hash of this block um so it implies that the application layer once it gets the new application payload from the consensus part will assemble a block and check that this block is assembled correctly with regard to these constants by, by checking the um, the hash of this block is equal to the one that is given by the consensus part. Uh, also worth mentioning that the consensus and application block trees are uh, has a one one to one mapping. So every like a beacon block as the reflection in the application chain and all the ports uh, of the like beacon, beacon chain are reflected in the application chain as well. But uh, the uh, beacon chain is uh, the primary one here and the application chain is a secondary. Yeah, so. Why does the application layer have to hash it? Isn't it receiving it and through a trusted channel? Like does, doesn't the application layer trust the consensus layer to give it a valid block? Like in, in terms of things like hashing the block. It trusts, but uh, you don't trust uh, other peers that send you a block. So this is a part of block uh, validity process. So right. this so, is one of the validity conditions. Yeah. Is it the, receiving? The hash is included in the payload, but the, the consensus layer doesn't actually check the consistency of that hash with the payload and it's actually ask, asking for the application layer to check the consistency of that. I see. Um, out of curiosity, why is it that direction since the consensus layer receives the block first, is that correct? Yep, that's right. So wait, wouldn't that create a DOS vector sort of in the sense that the consensus layer is doing work to pass the block on to the application layer before doing a very simple check just to make sure uh, it's it, reasonable? It does not create a DOS vector because uh, before this uh, part uh, starts to work, I mean, this uh, application block processing part, uh, the uh, signature uh, that is on the beacon chain 
the validator signature under the block mm. is verified. OK, so the consensus layer receives a block, uh, verifies the signature, which means we have someone to slash if it's bad. And then it sends the block down to the application layer, and the application layer does the actual validation of the block itself. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's correct. But yeah, no, not the slash and part of it. So it's not going to be slash, just or find. The block will go find. But it's, it's still like, it's, it's like if you did a proof of work on an invalid block, uh, that is going to be gossiped around the network, but then it would be quickly dropped because the, like, in, they would be seen as invalid. And there's a huge opportunity cost in, in doing so. Um, so it's kind of like the yeah. analog. OK, because you can only produce one block for your slot. And so you sign, if you sign two blocks for your slot, then you get slashed. And so if you sign a bad block, you're just wasting your slot, basically. Is that right? Correct, correct. And there would be a, a you know, minor amount of work you can do on the network, similar to like wasting your proof of work block. OK. Uh, this actually could be verified by the beacon chain part, but it needs to get RLP on board and catch up to 56 to do this. So uh, it's proposed to, to, to make it to the responsibility for the application layer. But hashing a block is on the order of microseconds. So I don't think it's really relevant. We can just hash it and done. It's an, it's not about execution time. It's about like where the code uh, complexity lives, I guess. Yeah, so like it's it, not about. Yeah, but the I consensus guess, layer doesn't. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry about it. Uh, I just want to say that I guess as from from a get developer perspective, I would say that anything I get from somebody else, I'm going to check anyway. I don't care whether I should check it or shouldn't. So oh, I see. I think it makes sense for ETH1 clients to actually validate that the requests are meaningful and not just blindly trust everything. Actually, one, um, one quick question here. So when a yeah, beacon chain client passes a block to an applic to the application client like over that wire is it's is is the intent for it to still be in s in a sz form or in like a list of fields form or is the intent for it to already be an rlp form it's like a json payload at that point right yeah. where the json payload just contains like the fields so it would be so okay so that so the application uh, clients would be doing the rlping Correct. Yep. It would okay. bundle up the fields it gets plus some of these constants, like right. like difficulty equals one and, and a couple mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. To, that to kind of that makes sense. Mm -hmm. cool. yep. mm -hmm. that makes... Let me see. Just a quick note for non devs who may be watching the recording. I guess there's a slight abuse of notation when we talk about consensus layer and application layer. Like traditionally, the application layer is what you think of Uniswap and Maker and all the dApps. In this case, for us, the application layer um, is kind of the EVM layer. So it's um, the management of the EVM uh, mempool, the management of the EVM state and, and, and all the execution layer. Um, and then the consensus layer is just the, the, the beacon chain layer and the proof of stake. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually added uh, a little bit of a glossary in the beginning of this document to just describe exactly that. <laughs> what is it like the the consensus block, application block, yada, yada, yada. It's, it's very basic, but yeah, so we use these terms a little bit more consistently. Uh, yeah, thanks for this uh, very helpful comment. Um, I, I, I forget to mention this, uh, like the notation, uh, you know, uh, implications. Can we find a better name for it? Um, for the application layer? Well, One application layer is actually, the... actually a bad name, I think, because yeah. that's already in use. Execution layer? Yeah, something um, like that. The execution layer, um, it's not, it's not mm -hmm. actually about the execution only. It, it will cover much more than the execution. Like the core thing is the execution, right? But yeah, well, probably. Yeah. We should probably take this one offline. Uh, yeah, I think that we will we can debate this for a while. 
Um, yeah, for for the record, it covers like the um, transaction pool. It covers the man the chain management uh, history retrieval. So much more than the execution. Um, okay, uh, so uh, Peter mentioned that uh, the GAF, like in the good design, uh, the GAF would validate everything that is coming from the consensus counterparty, right? Well, I mean, obviously things that we can validate. I mean, uh, whether something is a chain head or not, we're just going to have to trust you on that. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, the, yeah. I was just like, you know, uh, I was just going to mention this uh, that there will be a trust, you know, between consensus and evocation anyway, and it's going to be a trust, uh, trusted communication channel between them. But yeah, any any sort of consistency checks and things like that are, are certainly valuable, especially if they're cheap. Right, um, and I, I guess uh, well. If the consensus layer will check the block numbers, right, that they are uh, consecutive and check the uh, parent hash that is matching the head of the, the previous head of the chain. So the get will do the same checks actually um, and check the guest limit formula. So yeah, that makes sense. I mean, to do in both sides. So it doesn't take much uh, computation resources. Um, yeah, okay, so some particular fields, uh, sorry. Quick question, uh, you probably possibly will get to this later too, so feel free to tell me to buzz up. But um, basically, uh, currently the Beacon Chain node would notify the ETH1 client of these various events. Does that mean that there's a one-way communication where the ETH1 client is running the server and the RPC server, so to say, and ETH2 client dials in as a client? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it, it, at least it proposed this way, like the uh, unidirectional communication, but uh, we can think about like bidirectional, bidirectional, if it makes sense to do it that way. No, I'm just asking for clarifications on document. I'm not saying we should do it this way or that way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So currently it's unidirectional communication. So the consensus layer just sends the message and waits for response and um, a coordinate action from the application part. Yeah, I think this is a natural design because like the whole point of the beacon chain is pretty much to be like, this is the head. I want to build a new head. It's kind of the, the driver in that respect. So. I think it simplifies reasoning about it that way. Mm, yes, there's one slight detail. For example, if um, if I just start up the ETH1 client, then the ETH1 client needs to wait for the ETH2 client to, to do something. Otherwise, it's just idling. So it cannot initiate any actions, which means that I, I must wait for a new head RPC call and just wait until then. So I, I don't have the capability to just tell the ETH2 client that, hey, I just crashed, I just recovered, give me a head. That's not necessarily a problem. And I'm just, again, just exploring the design. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I mean, I would, yep. yeah. Okay. You so can even can... do that using RPCs, right? If you have streaming endpoints. Like it doesn't have to be that one party is always the initiator. Yeah, of course. It just, it's just right. a, a thought. Yeah, I would presume if you do crash and you restart, you're going to get a new head very soon. <laughs> but the also the well, we can talk about this. But I I think the the beacon chain would then be kind of stuck because it wouldn't have its endpoint, so it would be no no, it's just be waiting. Right. Oh, no, so we, yeah, but, but yeah, so recovery that was complex. This means if guest, guest crashes and restarts and I'm going to wait for the beacon chain, then the beacon chain will just be stuck because it just lost its guest. And then, yeah, anyway, so it's just a funky detail. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. And if, uh, the, uh, if we have like two separated pieces of software, uh, then this is still like a client. Uh, so the consensus node and the application node, this is still one client and if uh, the application part just crashed then 
we can say that the entire client crashed. So yeah, it should be some kind of status message or ping or whatever, or yeah, or we can put a response into um, one of these messages because they will be frequently sent by the consensus layer, like the block and your head uh, that the application node crashed and, um, and act accordingly on the consensus part. So um, yeah, but I think that this is the uh, like implementation details more. Um, so, and for consensus purposes, for for uh, chain management purposes, uh, like this uh, unidirectional channel should be enough to go with. Yes, so just one, sorry, I'm keeping derailing this discussion. So uh, although it seems like an implementation detail, the reason I'm uh, kind of want to highlight that it's not necessarily because, for example, synchronization code or uh, events that we re react upon, they also depend on what we can do. So it's, it's not just something internal, it kind of somewhat drives synchronization too. It, and it's, essentially we can do it either way. So it's, there's no good or bad solution because either, so either design will work. It's just the implementation kind of has to follow the capabilities of the API. Anyway, I I stopped derailing. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, need to think about it more, I guess. Uh, okay, so some fails here. Um, difficulty and nonce are um, yep, deprecated and set to constants. Uh, why difficulty is one here? It's set to one instead of like being zero. Uh, I think it makes some some sort of sense on the um, like network, but let's not go into details. Like it, it would make sense to keep the difficulty increasing for the uh, probably if status message that is sent uh, by the application client, about by current uh, Ethereum mainnet client while one once it starts uh, and uh, connects to the other peers. So uh, I think we can not like focus on this now. So timestamp, timestamp will be um, will be communicated from the consensus part. It's gonna be um, the uh, time of the, the timestamp of the current slot uh, where the block is uh, producing or executing. So there will be no rewards uh, for the block. Uh, and uh, yeah, transaction fees or transaction tips after 1559 will go to the beneficiary or to the Coinbase. So that's that's it um, about the block processing part. And uh, so specifically, there are rewards, but there's no rewards given out to like the no issuance given out by the uh, the EVM, you know, to the to the Coinbase anymore. It's all handled on uh, beacon chain side of the validator. Yep. So does uh, will that change when the Coinbase's balance increases from the perspective oh, of when it's usable? That's like hmm. Would that would, would this be an implementation challenge? Well, okay. I guess a block would be aware of whether or not it's post transition because it can check its mix hash. Hmm. Uh, could could you like repeat the uh, question once again? Uh, sure. To take a step back, uh, currently, when you are a block author, you are rewarded with ETH fees. And I don't actually know if that happens at the beginning of the block or the end of the block, but you definitely can spend them as soon as the next block happens. And um, is that changing with when they move the consensus no. and therefore block rewards? So there's still, there's still a beneficiary. There's just zero issuance to that beneficiary. The fees still go there. Okay. And the fees will be accounted for in as part of the uh, state route, like in the, in the count tree, right? And so it'll still be usable like right away by users. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. It'd be usable in the yep. same exact time it's use, usable now. Okay. The only thing that changed that we don't have this two ETH per block now, like we have now. Gotcha, okay. And so I'm assuming the consensus layer when it tells the application layer to make a block, it will send and use this Coinbase as part of that package. Is that correct? Correct. 
Okay. Peter. Mm, so I just wanted to highlight something. I, I'm guessing most clients are already capable of it. So essentially once we uh, set the block subsidy to zero, or maybe even with 1559 on mainnet, uh, an interesting thing happens that all of a sudden you can have um, blocks, multiple blocks having the same state root hash. Uh, this currently on mainnet is impossible because the ether is always accumulating, so you cannot have repeating hashes. But this, for example, can happen on click networks like Gurley and Rinkaby, and it's a pain in the ass to always make sure that uh, the clients handle it correctly. So I just wanted to emphasize that once we hmm. remove the block subsidy, every empty block will actually produce the same root hash as the previous one, which may or may not be desirable. I mean, it's fine. Just clients need to be aware of this quirk. If we want to be lazy, we can just decrease the subsidy to one way, right? Well, in theory, yes, but in practice, uh, 1559, if it starts burning things, we still might end up with uh, a duplicate state. Wait, but does a, are the base fees in 1559 paid by the transaction senders and not the Coinbase? Yeah, but a coin, yeah. you could have a Coinbase send one transaction that burns exactly uh, the oh, like rewards with the fees. So I the see. state route would be the same, which is actually mm -hmm. an, an optimization you could make as of 1559, because you can mine, you can get your first block on the wire much faster because you don't need to actually calculate new state route. And so, right. you so can this, just this, is, uh, this is theoretically possible even before the merge as of London, right? Correct, assuming 1559 goes into London. Okay. In fact, I think this is would be wise for miners to implement this because it gives them a slight edge. Mm -hmm. One more kind of related follow-up is that the if you have the the overlay beacon chain and you have this kind of application chain embedded inside of it um the application chain i think at this point uh, in this current design could have uh two branches that have the same roots at the end of them uh because you essentially you don't have this proof of work you don't have the knots uh you can have the same application payload on two different branches um from the same parent and so there, we said there was like a one-to-one -one relationship. I think we could probably make it potentially there was a one-to-one -one relationship by including something in there, but uh, it is subtly not a one-to-one -one relationship, but we can maybe talk about that in another context. Right, so it will have like two block hashes, like it will have identical block hash, right? Which is I mean, almost certainly block. fine because if, if the beacon chain says set head to this, and set head to this from the layer from the perspective of the application layer it's like it's totally it's the same thing uh the, the, it's just the beacon chain can be consensus on the same uh post state uh, in terms of the application layer so again that's probably actually not much of a design issue yeah yeah but worth considering anyway um yeah okay so um Moving a bit forward, the external fork choice rule. Uh, it just means that there is no more total difficulty fork choice rule, and uh, the application layer tracks uh, the messages uh, from the consensus um, about uh, not notifying that there is a new head and uh, it must uh, do the rework or do not the rework if it's not needed according to what's uh, new head to, to the observation of the consensus layer is currently is so that's it sounds pretty simple and but i guess it will be a, a big chunk of work to um to make the current minute client to modify it to like follow this external folk choice rule but but um, mm -hmm. In, in theory, it, it's okay as long as one specific condition holds. And actually, that was my question. So by setting the difficulty to one, that's actually nice because we can still track the longest chain. The question is, can it happen that the beacon chain will tell me that up until now I had a chain of three blocks 
and the new head will be block number two on the side chain. Yes. So can it happen that it shortens the chain, the canonical chain? Yes. Okay. Then so, guess, guess yeah, it, uh, the difficulty will not work uh, because uh, uh, in, in the like uh, current uh, fork choice rule, it's very simple and uh, each block is like self-sufficient in terms of the fork choice. So it adds some difficulty and you can decide right away uh, whether it's the head or not. But uh, on the beacon chain, the things uh, like more complicated uh, because uh, the new head can be updated. Like the block can become a new head like uh, uh, a couple of slots after it's been, you know, um, it's been observed, it's been inserted and processed. So. And that's why replacing this uh, mechanism by just increasing the difficulty won't uh, work. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently on the beacon chain, how do we have reorgs? And if yes, how deep are those reorgs? So I'm not necessarily saying how deep can they be, rather naturally while the system is operating, what's the practical depth that happened? Has there been even a single reorg on mainnet? Like maybe one and bolt? Hmm? There are orphaned blocks from time to time. So it, presumably at least one node, the person who produced it is having to reorg out of that block. Uh, but other than that, I don't think we've seen much deep reorgs and maybe we should uh, at least <laughs> anecdotally no, but uh, we should take a look. Uh, in terms of the like, <clears throat> I can tell you that there's nothing really deeper than one. And I, I don't think that, uh, again, that, that's, that's just a kind of a local observation from a single node rather than the whole network. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so the reason I was asking is because at least in that the whole synchronization and block propagation is a lot of ugly complexity is due to handling these reorgs and side forks and whatnots. And uh, at least from a synchronization perspective, things can get a lot simpler if we don't expect reorgs. Of, of course, we need to handle it, but uh, it's one thing to handle it as a special occasion that happens once a day or once a week, and it's other to handle it five times per minute. But if, if it ha happens only occasionally, then it, it's okay. Yeah, I it think- happens all uh, the time. Oh. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that they happen all the time on the test nets. Uh, especially on the bigger ones. So when the validator counts are high and, and, and maybe people are not running on the best machines, then there's like multi-block reorgs. The other place where it typically happens is when people are syncing and they think they're already synced, but they're not quite. Those are two common cases at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another thing that kind of fits into there is that you have you also have this notion of finality, which uh, becomes kind of a natural place to do sort of state cleanups and pruning things. Um, whereas I know that's probably now handled as fixed depth. Um, so that's something to consider is that you would maybe only do those actions upon signal from uh, the beacon node that there was finality. Um, Which in the normal case should be a, a nicer, you know, a, a potentially more optimal place uh, to to prune, but in, in the extreme might be a worse place, uh, but it ends up being a variable place at least. Yeah, uh, that's not that we've seen any variance in finality on mainnet, but you kind of have to be able to plan for it. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so the folk choice, yeah, pretty simple. Uh, this like second uh, condition, uh, sec second like approach, then you can update the head, like, like if the new block is the, ch the child of the current like chain head. So this is, I guess this is the implementation detail um, that might be taken or not, so. Yeah, the main message here is the new head. So, um, okay. 
anything here uh, before we move to the network part? Anything that probably missed um, and we want to discuss right away? And just a random question. Uh, you had uh, you had the two messages, new block and new head. Um, does new head actually in the current spec or prototype send in the entire block or only a hash? Um, uh, it's not yet, you know, uh, there is no new head in current prototype, but it was supposed to send just the hash. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. New head could be used to signal reorgs on things that it should already have in there. So it should only be the hash. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and these two messages are causally dependent. So the new block and new head must be uh, pre processed uh, uh, sequentially as they come to avoid weird case when the new head points to the new block that hasn't been yet processed. So. And uh, the, like from the sender perspective, the, they will be consistent uh, from the beacon chain perspective because new head won't point to the, like the block that hasn't been yet processed. So. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, also assemble a block. Uh, it's like to produce the new, the new block it should point to the already processed block as well. Uh, so yeah, that's also a dependency here. Uh, and yeah, network, uh, like what's uh, the first change that the block gossip um, should be turned off on the application side. It should be like deprecated and uh, we, we, we can like, uh, we are now talking about the, like if uh, just imagining that the merge has happened some like ep some few epochs ago and it's completely like proof of stake mode. Uh, we can touch like this corner cases in the transition process later. Transition process is like complicated. Um, yep, has uh, a lot of edge cases and yeah. So the block gossip is, just doesn't work. Um, yeah, that's because the application layer doesn't know about the beacon state, about validators, and it just can't verify uh, that the block is eligible, that the seal is correct. And so that's that's handled completely by the beacon chain after the merge. Um, so there is the state sync proposal and the block sync proposal. This is just a proposal with an idea how can how could this be implemented? Um, so the basic idea behind state sync is that uh, it, it can use the fast or snap sync or whatever with the underlying network layer uh, that is currently on the mainnet. Um, so we use the same messages. Uh, the only, uh, like the big change here is that um, the application layer will know what the head of the chain is, what the current head of the chain is, and it will be able to start uh, download the state upon receiving this uh, new block and new head. Um, so request like new block will contain the state root, the new head will say that this is the head. So let's just start download this state uh, with that, uh, yeah, with this state root. Um, the chain history data, uh, which are headers, bodies, and receipts, uh, it would make sense to wait until the block is gets finalized. And uh, uh, it will mean that there is uh, one chain uh, between Genesis, starting from Genesis and ending up with this finalized block. So it makes sense to not, uh, you know, to not, uh, to, to wait for this event, uh, to get rid of the fork uh, management during the sync and just go uh, backward as it is now in the post sync, uh, download headers, download bodies, receipts, so forth. Uh, so, and yeah, one addition thing here is that there is no need to verify the ETH hash anymore. Um, because it's uh, proved by the proof of stake consensus of the previous chain. Um, and uh, yep. And 
Meaning when you're doing, when you, if you're handling kind of historic blocks prior to the merge that have an ETH hash, you don't have to validate it because the chain would be finalized on proof of stake side and thus it is a chain uh, with a known head and consistency of that chain is all you really need. Right. Do, uh, the question is, do I understand correctly that the state downloader is just, you know, bootstrapped with uh, some state root that is taken from the wire from the observation of the network and then constantly updated with the new state roots as the new block and or new block hash, uh, uh, new block uh, coming from the wire. Is it correct? Yes, almost correct. It, uh, it doesn't get updated every time the the chain progresses because that uh, there are about a few thousand modifications in every block, so it would it would keep downloading data that will get go stale in fourteen seconds. So currently, what we do is uh, if the root gets older than one hundred and twenty eight blocks, and um, that's the threshold for which. Uh, get maintains the state. So if, it, if the root is older than 128 blocks, then we just jump to a, a fresh root. And this way we, we just restart stating every 15 minutes instead of every 15 seconds. Yeah. But essentially, yes, we are surfing the chain head until the downloader, until the block retrieval catches up. Cool. So it will make sense to, you know, uh, probably jump uh, between finalized checkpoints and then yeah, but no, we, uh, it will need to, yeah. And, and it can process blocks from the last recent finalized checkpoints just to execute them all. Wow. It sounds like you could, you could be told the head consistently throughout that process and guests can just make the decision on locally on, on kind of where it's updating, where it's pointing to sync. Yeah, exactly. As it, as it so, today. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. Yes, there's actually, actually probably in the, not a good idea to uh, mix in the finalization into it because uh, tracking a few tiny forks on the head of the chain is fine. So if, if I have to download 12 million blocks, it doesn't really matter whether the top two or three blocks keep reorging each other. That's going to be fairly trivial to maintain or to manage. And the finalized block, I don't know how, how deep is the finalization layer currently? How many blocks? 64 blocks. Sorry? 64 blocks, 64, 64 blocks. blocks. Oh, that normally. Um, and I, my intuition too was that kind of just signaling new blocks and new head is probably enough to keep consistency with what you're really doing today rather than mixing in finality. I don't, I don't know if there's a big gain there. On thing. So the thing is that after, so even if we mix in finality and uh, I sync up to to the last finalized block and then start executing on top, the execution on top will need to do exactly the same side fork thingy management. So I'm not saving anything. But anyway, it's it's really a detail. Having a bit more information and context from the beacon node cannot hurt. So it's definitely not a bad thing to know that something was finalized. It just might be useless for a time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those signals should be sent and then you can figure out what to do with them. If to do with them. Okay, uh, so the sync is in process and there there is need there is a need to like notify the consensus layer that the sync is done. So um, like what is proposed is just to, you know, have like more rich status uh, for each new block message, but probably it looks like a crutch here. So, uh, but uh, that makes sense because uh, if the application node is able to execute a block, then it means that the sync is finished. So, Probably it worth doing it this way. Probably it worth like you know uh, to expo uh, to use the ETH sync uh, JSON RPC method. So that's that's like you know not sufficient detail, but just need to know that the consensus is um, like 
knows that the application node get, got synced and is able to produce blocks and doing this. So, but work. I think you want something like if block number or something because it's syncing or some whatever. It might be just synced to half of the chain and then that just doesn't have enough peers to know that more chain exists. So mm -hmm. you but, better like look at to which like to which block the node was synced to. So you so does it could it like basically execute the block or not? Well, once you enter proof of stake mode, the beacon chain is telling us the head, so we know exactly whether we're in sync or not. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's also possible that uh, for the first like twelve million blocks, we we are stuck somewhere, and we uh, but we stopped syncing already. Well, yeah, but if the beacon chain told me that I'm if I should be at block fifteen million, then I know I'm really behind. Yeah. So this issue kind could arise right before the transition. So before mm -hmm. the proof of stake no takes over the yeah. difficulty check. Or yeah, because as soon as we have a new head, then we definitely can figure out if we synced to this or not. Yeah, agree. Yeah, but I mean, this is probably, uh, I mean, it's probably a legit issue, but only if you are synchronizing exactly during the transition, which probably won't take too much time. So. Anything. It's a it's a definitely a corner case that needs to be kept in mind. Yep, Lucas. Uh so two things. Uh we are talking about block numbers here. I don't see block number and new block or new head. So uh will we get that and the second thing is um we are blocking the from the network we are blocking the block gossip so when we get a um, new block um, to the application layer the application layer now needs to download that block from other application layer parts yep. like from the or is the payload of the block going in, like all the transactions and et cetera? Right, so the new block will send the payload. It doesn't need to be downloaded from other peers. And uh, regarding the number, yeah, the number, the block number will retain, so it will be uh, subsequent, uh, subsequent block numbers um, of the application blocks as we have them today. So it will be sent uh, well, within this new block message as well. So as a part of the application payload. Thanks. Okay, any any questions regarding this state sync or any concerns? Yeah, Peter. <clears throat> yeah, just a tiny uh, addition that I, I think that's uh, what we said about the new block, it's true when we are already caught up to to the head, but when we're initially syncing, I guess we still need to just, uh, it won't be gossiped, but we still need to like proactively download it from the blocks from the other peers on the application layer, right? If we just got a new head and we have like zero yeah. state, then it's, uh, yeah. it's up to us yeah. to. Yeah, so the block synchronization yeah. method would stay the same. It's just the block broadcast or the block announcement that would get nuked out. Okay, okay. So Dev to, Dev P2P will just uh, will not use a new head and new block uh, yeah, the, notifications the anymore. Okay. okay. Yep, and uh, to give like the whole perspective, uh, uh, once uh, the client, this new client, this new like combined client uh, starts up uh, with like a fresh uh, state, um, so well, with the empty state and the empty chain, uh, what, what will happen? Uh, the first step is uh, for a consensus layer to catch up the head of the beacon chain. And then once it's, uh, uh, it's got up, uh, then it will be communicated down to the application layer, signaling that it can start, that it may start to download the state or uh, whatever, or download blocks.
can the consensus layer follow um, consensus head and with with a sense of authority uh, without the application layer being fully synced yet or at all i think so um in the long run, there's the nuance uh, that uh, the, uh, the the thing in the consensus layer that's dependent on application act, um, layer activity is uh, deposits, um, which like right after the merge, that's not an issue because deposits are just like viewed like, or because if one data voting is an honest majority thing, um, but eventually we, we would want to get rid of that mechanism. And so I guess like, the validation might have to be redone a bit. Like first, you would uh, sync the consensus chain, and if and if the application chain isn't uh, verified yet, then you would just like take the deposit the deposit roots on the trust, and then and remember them, and then later on when you get the application chain, you would check that everything uh, matches up. There's also a difference between following the head and necessarily being able to participate in the head. Um, mm -hmm. So like you wouldn't be able to build blocks with an application layer payload, mm -hmm. um, and Indeed. and there's also there's certainly grades of 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 being able to follow the head. Like you can there's a light client protocol. Right, there's right. just following the beacon chain. There's doing full validity checks. There's you know there's a lot of different mm -hmm. things. There. Right, but the, the default algorithm for a client following the yeah, consensus chain is going to be that like as part of the process of verifying a consensus block, they'll pass the corresponding application block along to the application client and check if it's correct, right? Right, right. So it's like if you just followed the proof of work chain and mm -hmm. you knew that the uh, proof of work was the biggest total difficulty, but you never checked consistency of execution, mm -hmm. you can certainly be mm -hmm. tricked. <laughs> yeah. Can the... Like, can... Go ahead. Uh, hypothetically, could someone running a consensus client who didn't want to or couldn't, for whatever reason, run an application client, could they produce empty blocks if their turn came up? Like, do you actually need a full application client to produce a block? Mm, or you just need could. something that can give you a thing that's shaped like a block? Well, if there are no transactions, then the state root remains the same. So you just yeah. you just take the last new block you got, and then you just feed it back to, or maybe just change the coin base and feed it back to the consensus client. Right, that's what I was kind of wondering. Can you do, is that valid? Like, would that work in theory? Uh, based on the current spec, yes, it seems to me. Yep. You wouldn't actually be able to kind of validate that you're actually even on the right chain, right? So, so basically you, you could build on top of one block and just hope there would be a valid one, but you, you wouldn't, you would have no way of knowing. Well, if you trust the ETH2 client that this was the head block, then I mean, yeah, sure, you didn't validate it, but if in general there aren't attacker blocks in the network, then it's a good heuristic. Like it's, yeah. it's not a bad strategy. It's either that or nothing, and you at least get your reward if you produce something. Um, it's a bad strategy in terms of verifying the block. If you're attesting to a block with that. I don't, I don't know if this is healthy or not. <laughs> By the way, just to um, go back to the previous note, previous question, um, I think the question was whether the, the beacon chain or the consensus chain needs to be able to sync without the application layer. And uh, I think that would be a hard yes. Uh, I mean, you can debate the trust model, but the thing is that uh, the expectation is that the state try will only be available for the head few blocks, maybe head 64 or 128 blocks. This means that uh, in order for the application chain to synchronize the state, it must have the root hash, a recent root hash. So the consensus chain, the consensus client needs to be able to provide a recent root hash. Right. Okay. And ultimately rely on the application layer to get to the head and, and know that things were consistently processed rather than kind of knowing it in real time as it's passing things in there during sync. So I guess it's the security model would be similar to, to fast sync uh, 
essentially just download uh, not the latest head or not the latest state, but some recent-ish state, and then just execute a whole bunch of blocks on top and make sure that they, nothing goes wrong. Right. Yeah, I, yeah to, at the end of the state sync, it's, it, as it is now, it uh, executes some block on top of the most recent state, right? To, yeah, to catch up with the head. Well, it, it doesn't execute it to catch up with the head because it could download, it could end up exactly on the head. It, it's just rather a security mechanism that in order okay. for you to, to feed somebody a bad chain or bad state, you would also need to mine 64 blocks on top. And that's the expensive right. part. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Um, the block sync proposal. The idea is pretty much the same. Um, so the once the head is known, uh, the application layer may download uh, headers backward, backwards in the reversed order and then execute them. Application. Mikhail, you cut out for like 20 seconds. Or 10 seconds. Sorry, can you hear me now? I think so, yes. Okay, so something weird happened. happened. Okay, so it could be hybrid strategy when the application node starts up and uh, starts uh, syncing blocks from the first block and uh, at the same time, uh, the consensus layer catch up with the head, communicate this head to the application layer and uh, um, syncing forward and downloading the ha headers in reverse order. Uh, then this chain, uh, these two like downloading processes converge at some point and then goes forward. So it's also like an option here. Yeah, you don't um, want to do that. <laughs> it's uh, it's well, way too complicated. I mean, it, it right. to go horribly wrong. And then you would need to check the proof of work. And if you run out of proof of works, then you cannot verify anything. And the other thing is that if uh, currently the proof of work chain is kept alive because everybody is keeping mining proof of works on top, but once, uh, once uh, the head is directed by proof of stake, essentially I can mine an alternative reality for Ethereum that is heavier than the original Ethereum. So, so you, you don't, don't want to verify proof of stay, uh, proof of work because you're going downwards and you always have uh, information about the parent hash. So when you when you receive the hat from the proof of stake chain, then you have information about the parent hash. So you're always verifying the parent hashes, and at some point you reach genesis, which means that you are sure that you you reach the same genesis as you would be in the normal chain. It's actually how we currently synchronize the mind. So, so it's exactly the same behavior as you have currently. Yeah, of course. I was just saying that you, uh, if you start from the head, then you cannot also start from genesis and meet in the middle. Yeah, agreed on that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, so the, starting from head and downloading the header chain and then filling it, that's completely valid. That's Sorry, I didn't hear that part. Okay, so uh, by the way, how much time does it take to download the chain of headers uh, for the current mainnet? 15 minutes. It's about three gigs. No, it's actually for 5.5 gigabytes currently. Yeah, so 15 minutes doesn't sound that bad uh, because this block sync is, why, uh, is like desirable for and useful for running the archive node. So the entire sync process after uh, it's bootstrapped with headers will take much more time. I mean, it's, it's the, the mechanism is very similar to Turbo Geth and it's uh, header and block body downloads is the, it's the minority of time. So it's, uh, I don't think it's a problem. Okay, any questions for the network? Um, what's probably missed here? Um, anything uh, that comes to your mind?
So I have a question about, um, do we consider here any adjustments to where the bodies are stored? Like, um, did you consider discussing that also with this idea that comes from Piper's team uh, at Trinity on the DHT around block bodies? Because block bodies are quite heavy, so sure. they take like, I believe 150 gigs nowadays, and uh, they take a bit longer to download. So um, yeah. do you consider- The nice thing- yeah. The nice thing about this proposal is that it doesn't, it's not opinionated about what happens kind of on how the application layer gets synced. And so by default, we reuse things as is, but that can, those promises can be broken, you know, where things are stored can be changed, protocols can be changed. But for the purposes of getting this merge kind of in place and basically expect is that this, this does work. Whereas Similarly, in the future, if you if you move bodies to DHT um, and you had a different way of retrieving them, and like the 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 current protocols were the promise that they were there was broken, you can still get kind of set head from from beacon chain and choose how to go retrieve that information. Um, so uh, they're definitely decoupled in a, in a nice way, but uh, we still should be pushing on and, and considering how to make that sustainable in its own way. Okay, makes perfect sense. Thank you. Okay, anything else before we move to transition process? Um, okay, so the transition process, the like, the complexity of this process comes with the the requirement for the software to like be able to operate in these three modes. So the software, uh, like the client will be, you know, um, updated like some, some decent amount of time before the merge, before the like uh, potential point of the merge. Um, and then it will have to operate in the proof of work mode uh, for, uh, unless the tr transition conditions are met, then transition mode comes uh, where the, like uh, the transition mode means that uh, the total difficulty rule is replaced by the external fork choice rule, by the fork choice rule that is driven by, uh, by the beacon chain, but blocks are still gossiped on the, on the application network and uh, yeah, and once this first first block that is proposed by the proof of stake proposer gets finalized, then the software turns into proof of stake mode, which is after the merge mode or yeah, and operates in that mode normally. So that's the complexity of the process. Um, and yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, I have one question here. What uh, what happens in the in the case of consensus issue between uh, major Ethereum one clients? Uh, what do you mean by consensus issue? So, uh, you mean like the, there is a consensus break, right? So yeah. one chain is yeah, I see. Um, so that's interesting. The it depends on how big chunk of, you know, uh, it depends on how big chunk of uh, nodes uh, on like the main net went out of consensus. So if it but will be it like the, the Ethereum two nodes that are listening to minority Ethereum one client will be slashed or? They won't be slashed, they will be orphaned. So their blocks will be orphaned by the fork choice rule uh, of the beacon chain. Yeah, so they would be penalized slowly, you know, they would stand to lose about as they stand to make. So like if they were on that orphan chain for a year, they would, you know, lose eight, 9% of their, their stake. Um, and yeah, it's, it's similar to what would happen today. You know, if 75% of the miners were on client A and 25% were on client B and client B disagreed, then, uh, you know, the, the chain weight of, of client A would be much greater than the chain weight of client B uh, once things kind 
of resolved, um, but it ultimately becomes like a what is correct and which which version of software do people need to fork and go in that direction. But in terms of proof of stake, if you had greater than two thirds on one of them, there would be like a finality signal happening. So that's something to consider. So like two epochs after this chain break, uh, things would likely finalize which would be a much stronger signal than say just a proof of work. Um, but even then, it's definitely a catastrophic scenario for depending on how much of the network is on that and should be avoided similar to today. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so the transition process uh, like on the consensus layer looks like as follows. So there is the total difficulty, um, a, a certain value for the total difficulty and once it's reached by the um, mainnet, uh, the beacon chain uh, will like track uh, all the blocks uh, from the mainnet. So it will already be uh, a combined client with the uh, beacon chain and the uh, with beacon node and the uh, application node, um, which the application node is still operating on the proof of work uh, conditions. And uh, once the total difficulty met, uh, the um consensus layer uh will take this block this last proof of work block and uh, build uh, a block uh, the first proof of stake block on top of uh, this one and uh, yep uh, communicate this to the application layer so it will send this block in a new block message and then in the new head will be sent um accordingly so uh and once the application node receives this message messages it uh, turns to the external fork choice rule and starts following these messages uh, from the consensus layer there will be also a sample block uh, for some cases when you will have to produce a block so um, so it's eligible for the proof of work node as well um, and then after some time um, the finalized block for uh, the first finalized block message is called, and then the application node understand that this is the time to turn off the, the block gossip and turn to the proof of stake node. So that's how it uh, look like from the uh, ch chain progress perspective. Yeah, Peter. Uh, yeah, uh, just a question. So basically, if you are in proof of work mode, then if you've been chosen as a block block proposer on a beacon chain, then you will receive a sample block. If you've been chosen as a block validator, uh, then you will receive a new block and the rest will receive a new head, right? Uh, when the first block is being proposed. Uh, mm, right, right. And uh, when you send this new block to the application node and the application node doesn't have like the uh, that doesn't know the parent of this block. It will have to download uh, its parent and its ancestors. Yep, to verify it. Um, so, otherwise, uh, the attester will not be able to attest to this block unless it's fully executed. This is important. Um, yeah, Peter. Uh, two questions. One of them, you mentioned that while we are in proof of work mode, the beacon chain will follow the ETH1 chain to figure out when it wants to transition. But how exactly will the beacon chain follow the proof of work chain? Um, probably by calling the Git. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, right? Um, like Git, Git block by hash currently contains total difficulty, right? It returns total difficulty. Double difficulty or total, total, difficulty. total, total difficulty, yeah. yeah total difficulty. No, um, I don't know. Only it's uh, only I, when I head. checked you when I checked the RPC interface, it gets it, it or at least the uh, the doc said that it returns total diff. Yeah, yeah, but it's so, a because it doesn't, we can always add it, so it's not, yeah, yeah. yeah. There will have to be an RPC endpoint uh, that will contain this total difficulty, the block hash, like the head, you know, the, this information uh, yeah, for, for the block. And also uh, it will need to be, uh, uh, mm -hmm. it, it will have to contain the flag where, whether this block is valid or not. So it also like required. Mm -hmm. 
the uh, um, the beacon node already like asks the application node for like the, the head because it has to do uh, do eth one data voting, right? Right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, they all have are able to communicate to eth one nodes today um, on some limited interface about state and head. Probably it would make sense to, uh, since these RPC methods, if they will be implemented as JSON RPC, will sit on the separate board for security reasons. It probably will make sense to implement one more uh, RPC method that will uh, uh, aid uh, this process. Okay, uh, another question. Here you have between a proof of work mode and the proof of stake mode, you have uh, this transition mode. And isn't it this? I mean, I don't really understand why we need this middle ground. I mean, obviously, we didn't finalize a block yet, but uh, mm -hmm. why does that matter? Uh, we want uh, block gossip to uh, keep working on the application layer until the, we get the first finalized block. Uh, but, this is uh, big, yeah. so if you expect so if the ETH1 client is expected to receive new block and new head then how I mean I propagate a block but I don't know whether it's relevant or not I don't know how to choose the fork I mean what do I, I do guess the uh, uh, the idea is that like while the transition is not finalized there is still the possibility of the beacon chain reorging to a different beacon chain that has a new first embedded block. And to check that different first embedded block, like that first embedded block would have a proof of work parent. And that proof of work parent like, could potentially be, uh, well, would be mined and it could potentially be mined at some point later. And so you still need the ability to keep broadcasting them. But after the trans the first embedded block is finalized, then like there's nothing that can possibly happen on the proof of work side that's relevant to the validity of any beacon block, and so you can stop a, a broadcasting proof of work blocks. Okay, but then the important uh, detail here is that um, I'm only broadcasting the proof of work part of the blocks. So if I have three new proof of work blocks and a hundred new proof of stake blocks, then I will only broadcast mm -hmm. the three proof of work ones. Right. Correct. Right. I, don't, I don't think there is any reason to broadcast uh, proof, of, uh, proof of stake blocks over um, using the application clients. And you could even probably not, you could even restrict proof of work block gossip such that um, you only broadcast blocks that are past the total difficulty of, of one by one block and no further children on such chains. Um, because the only valid blocks to include on the proof of stake side would be like that first child past the, the total difficulty. Um, or depending on how, if you're doing greater than or equal to, you just right at that threshold. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that make sense? Um, okay, cool. Peter, anything else here? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, in proof of work mode, you have the assemble block. And right. when I call the assemble block, that means that I'm switching over to proof of stake. I don't need a valid proof of work mind on that one anymore. So I just need uh, the transactions executed, and that's it. Yeah, right. So, yeah. So this yeah. is just give me a, a block on top of. Uh, this one. Okay, and um, in this case, the block hash, I mean the, oh wait, so I cannot, okay, never mind. Um, actually, assembling a block will happen on top of the current head, so the current proof of work head. This is likely to happen. So uh, the first proposer of the proof of stake block with, with embedded uh, application payload will uh, get its head of uh, the proof of work chain, proof of work chain, uh, and uh, uh, ask to assemble a block on top of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, and 
it might not be the head for the rest of the network, but until this block is valid, um, until this proof of work block, uh, this last proof of work block is valid and meets, uh, meets the uh, transition conditions, then uh, everybody is okay with that. So it's valid. Um, okay, so Michael also raised hand previously. Do you have any questions or? No, no, Dan, Danny already answered it. Okay, cool. Okay, um, anything else for the transition part? And we'll, yeah, by the way, one thing here is that the transition we, uh, is that clients with the transition mode will exist uh, sometime after the merge happened. So if you start this client, it will need to be designed in a way uh, that it uh, can handle everything correctly. So the merge happened, but it doesn't know about it yet. So it will need to take this information from the network, but I don't see any big issues with that. But yeah, definitely worth to think that through. And uh, what, and after some time, uh, you know, uh, after some after some time of the merge, I guess the clients will just uh, throw away this transition process from the code base. And, yeah, it will just. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a, oh. an interesting question. Um, so, essentially, when I start up an ETH one client, uh, I need to know whether. I mean, proof of whether I should start syncing the network using proof of work mode or whether uh, I should wait for the beacon chain to give me something. Yeah, so that's, I guess it could be an implementation detail. So you may have this flag, right? If you know that the merge has happened, but if you if you don't know for some reason, you, you can start, start operating the proof of work mode uh, and then uh, once the uh, some message comes from the proof of stake, like new block and new head, you can like you know readjust uh, your mode. Uh, yeah, node can the client can readjust its mode. Yeah, it's going to be a bit messy. For example, if I start up a fresh uh, client combo, so neither if one client nor if two client are synced at all. I don't know how much time it takes for the E2 client to sync up, but um, up until that point, the E2 client will do weird things. I mean, I will start downloading the state root for something that might be completely invalid because right. maybe some miner remained on the original chain and didn't fork off, and then they are just advertising some weird uh, states that I will actually sync to or try to sync to up until the point where. Uh, the proof of stake note says that hey 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 stop merge already happened yeah yeah and uh, you, you can uh, like add the uh, block hash for the first proof of stake block uh, you know so just to uh, the same way the dow hard fork block has been handled on the network if it helps but it it, it requires some intervention you know so uh, this is the same to say that the merge has happened you know uh, it requires some in in intervention from the user yeah, so I guess it would be advisable to, well, for one thing to have some form of flag or somehow to control this and for the other thing to, for client devs, I mean, if one client devs to maybe do a release after the merge, a quick release to just uh, flip the switch. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, if it uh, still requires to sync the old, uh, old, uh... <clears throat> like proof of work chain, then I think yeah, it makes sense after the merge to make a kind of release that's kind of hard codes the block and maybe the root hash of the last proof of work block and just start syncing to this block immediately because why not? Uh, even though proof of stake might not be uh, synced yet because uh, you will know after after the merge actually happens. Uh, you cannot really sync to the uh, to that specific uh, state because it will be pruned from the network. So. It, uh, the, I guess the only important thing is to know whether the merge happened or not, so that we know whether we should wait for the beta chain to signal the head or not. If I may interrupt for a second, 
So, how about so maybe one has. Sorry, we can't hear you well. So, how about just uh, we can hear you right now? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Maybe. Say it again. It's very crackly. Oh, sorry, I can't. Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to say that maybe uh, we could just add some. Yeah, it's still, it's still, it's still very, very bad. Could you please, could you make uh, maybe post sorry, your I can't question to the chat? Post your question to the chat. Okay, um, Micah. So would it be reasonable to assume that given the most pathological situation where miners are running some custom code uh, towards the end, that we should expect to see many, many peers of the last block? So we will just see, like, assuming miners are uh, running custom, again, no client that is going to code this, but assuming miners all write their own code, the rational thing for them to do would be to just repeatedly mine <laughs> At, um, that last block over and over and over again, right? You mean to not to avoid meeting these transition conditions, right? To avoid uh, not to avoid meeting the transition condition, just to increase your chances that your block is picked as the last block is like your last chance to make money. And there's no reason you've got hardware; it's running. Wow. You might as well just keep mining that, remining that head. Uh, right. Is there but, any reason uh, not to do that? Uh, there is, I don't think there is a reason not to do that for miners, but that's okay, okay. for the transition process because, uh, yeah, the proposer mm -hmm. will pick what, whatever they had it observed at the moment. So I think. I mean, that's basically the worst case scenario, right? Like we want that. Yeah, yeah that's the just worst case that block. That's not. Nice. No, that's best. That's good. Who cares? Yeah. It's also not very incentivized because once the beacon chain picks a block uh, to build on, and there's attestations. Uh, it quickly becomes very difficult to reorg that the beacon chain. The, the, the miner can't do anything to reorg the beacon chain at that point to try to get their new head around that point picked in. Unless the miner is the um, Yeah, okay, we have like one more minute left. Um, any significant questions so far or, or we can continue offline? Okay, cool. Like my last question, um, what do you think are the reasonable next steps uh, towards the EIPs to spe spe towards specific specifying this all um, for the application layer? Do we want to discuss it more like go uh, uh, round and round through details or yep, does it make sense to work on this back? So I personally, for me, this is fairly clear. I mean, the exact format of these assemble block, new block, new RPC methods, they don't really matter. So whoever writes up an initial spec, I think we can run with it. I think there's already initial implementation in Catalyst. So um, I don't think if there's a need to detail it too much. One thing that's a bit murky for me and maybe that would be nice to, to investigate, is what happens uh, so with the, with the difficulty. And I, okay, you might say that this is a client implementation on how the clients uh, handle um, canonical chains that are not the most difficult ones, but I think that might be an interesting thing to, to discuss a bit. Um, you mean how to replace this fork choice? How it uh, will? No, I mean, uh, client implementation wise, how to make sure that uh, so currently the clients have it hard coded, so to say that uh, the canonical chain is, is chosen based on difficulty. And it might be worthwhile to investigate just how deeply this choice is, ro is uh, rooted in the clients. Okay. Does Cleek do a, um, a simulation of that or is Cleek independent of difficulty? Sorry, could you repeat that, please? The clique consensus mechanism, uh, does it simulate some sort of total difficulty or is it totally independent of proof of work? 
So I'm implying if, if we have clique, it, it, that's not proof of work. So I assume that it's maybe not too deep, but you would, can you help me understand? No, so um, the total difficulty is independent of proof of work. So uh, click also uses total difficulty for the fork choice. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so in click, uh, essentially what happens is that uh, uh, you have a batch of signers that can sign, but every time one is in turn and everybody else is out of turn, and then if you sign when you're supposed to sign, then your block has a difficulty of two, otherwise one. And this okay. ensures that there's always one block that is heavier than the rest. Interesting. I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. So it might be deeper than my expectation. I just kind of thought <laughs> that each one clients could handle generic uh, engines there. I'm guess I'm, I'm guessing if one clients do have a some kind of lower level set head method, right? That just like sets the head to, to whatever you want and does a reorg. Yes, that yes. does happen. There are a few Good. problems with it. Um, at least, for example, in get, if you do a set head, then that kind of deletes everything afterwards. So you cannot just jump between chains with the set head because it nukes. <laughs> things. That's what's supposed oh, to see. be used as a rewind mm -hmm. method. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, um, for example, uh, what get does when you get a side block is that it doesn't import it. It just stores it in the database as a flat mm -hmm. thing. It doesn't execute anything. And it only starts executing the side chain once the total difficulty exceeds the canonical one. Mm -hmm. And then we have this implicit thing behavior that we need to hack out somehow. I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's hard or not possible. I haven't thought about it, but it's a, mm. a non-obvious question. Good. You like, said it makes portions of the chain. Do you mean mm. any descendants? If it were to reorg to not ahead or, or what? I don't understand that. I'm sorry? You said uh, set head can nuke things. I didn't understand what you meant it can nuke. No, for, so for us, uh, uh, I think Vitalik mentioned that there's a method called set head in get, but that set head is meant to rewind the chain. It's not meant to jump between branches. Got it. Okay. So you would go to a common ancestor if you were jumping between branches, then you would set head to the, the head of the branch after that. Yeah, but I cannot do that. So set head is just, okay, you can rename it rewind head. <laughs> You can only go backwards, you cannot go forward. Okay, uh, yeah, so cool. Well, it's just, uh, I think uh, we should wrap up uh, and continue fine. Uh, this is a good comment, this is like good comment. I think that exercise with difficulty probably will be a good task for the hackathon. Uh, trying to do so something with uh, any of uh, the clients. Um, also, there is like a question or proposal, uh, like to, uh, yeah, tot virtual for total difficulty value, transition diff plus slot number. Um, it's not gonna work uh, because the uh, in the beacon chain the uh, block is not self-sufficient in terms of fork choice uh, because it's attested later. It could be attested later, and the station could be. Uh, included on chain uh, like uh, one slot after and it can it affects the it it has an impact on the fork choice so uh, virtual total difficulty will not work in this case um okay so with anything else before we wrap up fantastic document mikhail this is awesome um, thanks, Danny. Thanks a lot. Yep, yep. It's uh, all a great job. Okay. Um, thanks, Vitalik. Thanks, everybody, for this great discussion. Yep. I, I'm happy that we uh, go went through all this document and even happy that we didn't cover uh, other aspects of the agenda. It's, well, it can be due later on the subsequent call. So uh, this call is bi-weekly. So uh, uh, anybody who wants to have an invitation, let me know, uh, just DM me your email address. So see you tomorrow uh, on the all core devs call. And it's on this, it's now on this shared uh, calendar for these types of calls. Um, I I don't know who maintains it or where. Yes, it is. But <laughs> oh, Tim, yeah. So 
Yeah, I added I added it to the there's a like protocols call Google Calendar which lists all of the different uh, ETH one, ETH two, and 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 now merge calls. Um, I'll put the link in the chat right here if anybody wants to subscribe to it, and these calls are are included there. And uh, the cat holders will be documenting the notes for the call, uh, so maybe uh, it will be available and will be posted there in the GitHub repository. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. See ya. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Have a nice weekend or day. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thank you.